Hi there, everybody, and you are very welcome to the South Tip Arts Podcast. My name is Emer, and I'll be your host. Apologies for the voice, it's not the greatest this week, but that's all part of the fun of this fantastic changeable weather we've been having, no doubt. If you want to contact the podcast, the address is southtipartspodcast at gmail.com. That's southtipartspodcast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you, so please get in touch. And it's that time of year again and June Bank holiday weekend is upon us. And this weekend, Carrick will be buzzing once again for the Clancy Brothers Festival, which officially began on May the 29th and continues right through until June the 3rd. The festival honours the musical legacy of the influential Irish folk music group of the 60s, the Clancy Brothers, whose hometown was Carrick and Shore, and who are credited with popularising Irish folk song across the world. There's music and art in the theatres, in the pubs and on the streets, there's an absolute wealth of entertainment to be had in Carrick this weekend and I'd urge everybody to go and have a look at the website. There are literally so many things that I couldn't even begin to start to tell you about them. So clancybrothersfestival.com, go and have a look for all the times and dates of everything that's happening and make sure to head to Carrick for an afternoon over the weekend and show them your support. And Maggie O'Connor took up the job. Oh, Billy, says she are wrong, I'm sure. Biddy gave her a belt in the gob and she left her sprawling on the floor. Then the war did soon engage, woman to woman and man to man. Shalele law was all the rage, and our own eruption soon began. Now, over the last couple of episodes, I've been bringing you news of what's coming up during this year's Clonmel Junction Arts Festival. The flagship art piece for this year's festival features Schlievenemann, an installation by Molly Anna King, which is going to take place at the Arts Centre here from Tuesday, July the 2nd. Molly studied at the Crawford College of Art and Design before completing her Master's in Sculpture at the Slade in 2013. She's received several awards and community and facilitation feature as a large part of her practice. She's taken part in several residencies. Most recently, she was artist resident in LSAD's ceramic department, and she was also the artist in residence in South Tip Art Centre in 2018. She has also done some work collaboratively with artists Patrick White, Neve Reardon, Assemble Architects, and she was guest artist with the Domestic Godless for the Food, the Bad and the Ugly Tour, She's also been guest host for Callan Workhouse Union's Bring Your Own Chair Residency. For this project, Molly explores the use of ritual as a means of embedding the self in place and the artist engages with the physical and historical elements of Schlievenemann and the surrounding rural area drawn from androcentric folklore and the cairn located at its peak. Working through the idea of placemaking and home in the age of the housing crisis, the rural and female idyll is exposed through the use of ritual and routine actions. This lies between the geographic, the geologic and the architectural. Above ground is all calm, but the cairn's interior is the belly of the beast. Beckett claimed that habit is a great deadener, and it is through opening up this statement that the artist considers the act of habitually walking paths and tracks, seeing these landmarkings as vascular and so life-giving. This piece from the artist's statement, but on a recent visit to the Art Centre, I had a chat with Molly about the project and discovered that, very much like the landscape and the mountain, it is an ever-changing and organic thing and promises to be a very exciting piece of work. So Molly, um, you're a local girl. Would you start by telling us a little bit about your background? And I know you were in Crawford and you did your Masters in Slade. And I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll start from where I stopped. So I finished in 2013 after doing an MFA in the Slade. And previous to that, I did my BA in Crawford. And uh, I was in London for the few years thereafter in... Yard House Studios, which is part of uh, Assemble Architects studio space. And I was there for about five years after I finished in my MFA in the Slade, living in London and working in London, and moved back to Ireland in 2016 to do a commission 
for St. Angela's College in Cork and since then I've been working in the studio and I was given a residency as part of South Tipperary Arts Centre's outreach programme in 2018 and since then I've been solidly working on a project for this exhibition about Schliebnerman and the, the mountain and the folklore and uh, women in the countryside. So would that always have been, I know your work, you use natural materials a lot? Currently it does use natural materials, but previous to that, and it's always been architectural in a mm-hmm. sense, so that's kind of how I would, that would be my way in, say, mm-hmm. my investigative process, and how I would formulate things would be sort of through architectural and bodily mm-hmm. links. So uh, originally I was making artworks which were architectural in composition, so it would be like a lot of cement and glass and steel and metal, and and they would perform they would become bodies mm-hmm. so they would collapse throughout the the exhibition or they'd you know crumble or fall over and that kind of idea of architectural deterioration with uh, bodily and corporeal deterioration and from there I suppose my materials kind of reflect more like of a place say mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. the materiality is, a, is again another avenue in which I would explore okay. that yeah that okay, sense so of place and location that was kind of leading into my next question which was going to be would you say that coming from a very small village in Tipperary Mm -hmm. uh, um, I suppose your first experience of city living would have been Cork but on a bigger scale London do you think oh totally changed my perspective as to what materials were and also like the feeling you get when you're in front of like a rammed earth wall or like a hempcrete wall or Mm -hmm. you know a cob versus Mm -hmm. say like the facade of of a skyscraper like the gherkin or something in London you know it's completely different it's like there you feel like there's a a history in materials like Mm -hmm. um like a vibrant matter say whether it's wood or as as you said like natural materials versus the not necessarily coldness but how the body would interrelate to those structures instead, you know. Mm-hmm. So you're being led around spaces all the time and you're interacting with them. But a lot of the time it's to do with the materials and the warmth of a space as well. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I'm really interested in is how uh, how we relate to materials and how we use them and how we see them within sort of mm-hmm. architectural spheres and how they affect us, our psychology and our bodies. Okay, and then your move back to just the footage of Schlieven yeah. yeah. would have brought that as, I mean, I'm from around here as well, mm-hmm. so I totally relate to the um, importance of that structure as just, you know, over the valley yeah. sort of, it's it's yeah. just it's a constant, it's it it's is. the one thing you can rely on yeah, <laughs> to exactly, be there when you wake exactly. up every day and look out the window. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and you do see it as like this this form that not necessarily hangs over you like a building might in an urban situation, but it more sits there. Like mm. it is the landscape. And so but what I'm really interested in is like the ritual aspects of exteriors and landscapes as well. So mm. like in an increasingly secularized state like which originally we would have used religion as an escape now we don't we tend to use green spaces and Mm -hmm. blue spaces like water and Mm -hmm. like in in a way we're becoming more ritualistic in a sense but also it's the the routine of that that I think people tend to miss Schlievenman for me is part of like a ritual or a routine as you would if you were in an urban space, go for a walk through the city centre. A lot of people will now leave city centres and go for a walk in the countryside. And with that comes, obviously, issues around, like, the form of Schliebnerman and also the forms that we find ourselves standing on to almost regain a link with nature. Um, and then that's when the materials come back into it again, I suppose. Mm. That, like, you know, the use of like purity rituals and like water and heat and um sometimes clay as well so you're going back and you're going forward in a sense like through time as to how you would access a spiritual level through materials yeah 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 and yeah, architectural yeah. space and form and for me Schliebnerman is that both of those like 
Yeah. <laughs> so uh, during the process of working your way through this project, mm. how many times would you say you've Clanky. taken that path? Oh, like, I mean, around Shlivnaman, it's where I tend to, to walk. So there's like woodland areas mm-hmm. and I find myself doing loops because the woodland areas are loops. Shlivnaman is like an ascension and then a descension. And mm-hmm. there's all these like almost like motiveless motion to to keep you in stasis say Mm -hmm. you know so there's an equilibrium i think in in walking and routine and that's that's definitely explored and i couldn't tell you the amount of times i've i've climbed it or not because it just becomes it just becomes part of you um and whereas like you see all these different markers within the landscape but also like throughout the seasons it changes as well and you just it can become an obsessive routine, like your body sort of like it demands it after a while, you know. Like sometimes I think I'm half goat because I'm more comfortable on the slope <laughs> than you on the flat. <laughs> Very good. I haven't done it in a really long time. Oh, I, I, I must do it with you someday. You, you have should. To take you me should. I'd love to take a tour up there. Yeah, with people, it'd be you know? brilliant. It'd yeah. be really good. Yeah. Because I mean, people forget that like it is essentially a feminine form as well. You mm-hmm. know, so it's undulating and sloped and. But even just it's like a big breast rising out of the landscape. Exactly, <laughs> and that current you know, on the top is a and nipple. Then you know, the valley there. You know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Underneath is like the abundant fertility that comes from from being nestled yeah, against yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's so true. But I mean, like, it's interesting the way you say it has a feminine form because a lot of the time, you know, a lot of our folklore is very male dominated, like androcentric. And for a woman to climb that mountain I, and and discuss it, it's very or mm. different from a man climbing that mountain and discussing it because. I suppose you're you're looking through history as well as to how women were seen and like how we now like we would see it as a nurturing space. A lot of mm-hmm. people might see it as a sexual space, or mm-hmm. you know, there's mm-hmm. all these different variants and levels. And the original pieces that I was making when I started the residency, a lot of them were casts from stones from the Cairn, and they mm-hmm. were all about like the body and skin, and you know, like the idea of the undulating form and tableware and it was wrapped around how women display themselves and how they would have using interior decoration when people were coming into the house and the home mm-hmm. and now how women are like out of the home more and so it's it's more about their physical physique you know there's a lot of like striving to be a, a particular shape or fitness level you know and yeah. you see how women are now in no means I don't mean to say evolving but like how our sense of self is evolving uh, yeah it yeah. becomes less internalized and more externalized uh, and so that again comes with the the aspects of Schlievenemann I think like mm-hmm. mountain of the women it's quite a powerful statement um, and one that could be explored in any culture or any generation yeah 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 um, I've always found it quite an empowering it's very feminine and even disregard androcentricity yes. completely yeah. it's, it's no it's true but the story is the folklore surrounding it is yeah. interesting because like, it's women that were you know striving to run up a hill to marry a man yeah but wouldn't it be interesting to get it from her point of view rather than yeah. that he was so amazing that all these women wanted him and, because you it's, know it's funny cause, because folklore is ever you're right it's, it's ever changing it's a thousand different stories and this is just one but there's other stories where she was like she wasn't really pushed about it she wasn't really understood she just she she felt it was like a race she wanted to win she got there she met Fionn McCool he wanted to marry her and then down the line you know she ran off with someone else <laughs> yeah I, I think it, I think that's just part of it as well is like people will forever put their spin on it so yeah. I suppose it's all about perception. Totally, it? and where you're getting your folklore from, because in my research for this project, I've been looking at folklore from the late 1800s, early 1900s, and it's completely different where, you know, she was called uh, Grony the Ugly and things like okay, that. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah, and so I think it was originally a Kilkenny publication okay. from the Historical Society, and there's all these different like avenues and views of her, but you can you can definitely see it as a warning to women mm-hmm. as well. As in, it's just it's fascinating. It's almost like a deterrent, you know? <laughs> and that, that that's what folklore is. It's uh, all yeah, small yeah, yeah. warnings yeah. and life lessons. <laughs> Excellent, yeah, mm. true. What can people expect to see then? You know, in here in the center during the installation. It's something that's going to change over time. Well, well so it's going to be... Um... It sounds it sounds fascinating. I've heard little <laughs> tiny pieces, but I still haven't formulated that sense of 
people have said to me, oh, she's building a wall, oh, she's doing this. She's doing this. <laughs> you know? um, I started I started by telling people that it was going to be clay-based, and I think I'm going to keep it as that. Just the fact that it's clay-based and about the landscape, and because the landscape is ever-changing, and, you know, with the idea of ritual movements and repetitive and routine well-worn paths they'll often change and so Mm. throughout the exhibition the structure will do the same Mm -hmm. and I'd like to leave it open because you know it could be a curtain it could be a wall like I am trying to to bring in architectural language into it as well Mm -hmm. and and curtain walls and facades are of particular interest to me Mm -hmm. in relation to say display because a lot of them are like false walls and and I think that's interesting so there will be material explorations that will change yeah. over time, I think. Yeah. And but she, that is exactly what we were just saying about yeah. perception. As you learn and as you work your way through the process, things change. So exactly. So it's very hard to say what you're going to have at, at the end. True. And, that's, you know, and I suppose that's why documentation is mm, key. so important. Yeah, and yeah. I think it's, easy, it's easier to, to leave it more open for when people come in, say, than to be like, this is exactly what you're going to mm-hmm. see. Because... Mm-hmm. When I say that, someone isn't actually going to see what I see, you know. So I yeah. can say like, "Oh, this is an architectural structure." Someone's like, "Oh, that's definitely not like this is just a floor painting, or you know, or a wall piece that you've turned upside mm. down, or you know." I just love to leave it as open as possible. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see people's feedback, maybe from your absolutely. So it might be nice to because it will be installed, and then it will be more about how the material reacts to the space over the coming weeks and months. Yeah. So whether it so these are changes. outdoor materials that you're going to transfer indoors essentially, and exactly. I suppose in here we have our central heating, and yes. you know yes. it's cold in the night time. Yeah. What's going to happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It will be interesting to document the process of. It should be. I mean, like anything I've done previously, the 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 clay has a mind of its own. You know, unless mm. you're firing it and making it ceramic, then that's when it it's rendered inert. Yeah. But now it's just it's like a living, breathing material. So you can't even predict, I suppose, really, because from space on space, everywhere is different. Exactly. That's yeah. kind of, it's like little scientific experiments. Yeah, so. yeah, that's <laughs> true. It is. Yeah. It's Everyone is different. And mm. because I'm not using materials that would, say, have a, not necessarily a shelf life, but like mm-hmm. a, a documented, knowable reaction to a space mm. or a lack of reaction even. Yeah. You know, yeah. like once you build a cement wall, unless you've got a leak or something, then mm-hmm. it's just going to remain that cement wall. This is an exploration I suppose. and in terms of the clay that you're going to use is that clay sourced from the actual place yeah yeah, yeah excellent yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so it's all very um size so it's its own like we'll kind of be walking on sacred ground a little bit here. <gasps> I wonder will you be walking on it? that's the thing I'm gonna <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah I'm thinking of like elevating it and okay essentially this this work is about a play happy days by Beckett mm-hmm. and you see Winnie being up uh, up to her waist and stuck in a place. And then as the play progresses, she becomes more and more hysterical. And then in the second act, you see her up to her neck. And so it is this idea of being wedged in place and being mm-hmm. a woman and like using daily rituals and uh, routines to sort of get yourself through and to see, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. see the other side of it. Very good, very good. I really look forward to seeing it take shape now and just, you know, Thank I you. feel lucky that I'm going to be here every day uh-huh. and I actually will get to see the actual process of it. So if people are going to come and see it, it come see it more than once, definitely. It because would be brilliant if they did, I mean, yeah. what you saw on day one compared to what you would see on day 20 be maybe a radically different yeah. thing. Maybe, or, or maybe the exact same, who knows. But yeah, it would be lovely yeah. to have people come in because I think even the smell of the place will change. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 actually. That's going to be really good, yeah. <laughs> well, all the best, Molly. Uh, I would just <coughs> like to thank South Tipperary Arts Centre and Tipperary County Council for their support. And thank you, Emma, for the interview as well. You're more than welcome, Molly, and I look forward to seeing you taking tape. <laughs> Before I go, I just want to make mention of the current exhibition that's running in the centre at the moment. It's entitled Women of the Resistance, 101 Years of Women's Rights, Activism, Protest and Practice. It was officially launched on Thursday the 23rd of May by, still at this point, MEP hopeful Grace O'Sullivan, who is a fascinating woman to listen to. You can find the opening speech on Facebook if you'd like to hear what she had to say. 
This project is part of the Decade of Commemoration celebration, during which artist Theresia Guschelbauer is revisiting her Women of the Rising Reenactment project, which involved 65 Tipperary-based women in an exploration of women's role in the 1916 Rising. Using this as a starting point, Theresia is exploring the 1916 women activists coming up to and in the aftermath of the Rising, when many issues such as national sovereignty, women's franchise, anti-conscription and prisoners' rights were being campaigned for. The exhibition follows on from a recent lecture by UCD professor Dr Mary McAuliffe on the women of the revolution. This lecture was recorded and will be made available on the Art Centre's YouTube channel. We will post that on our social media pages when it's available and you can have a listen. But for now, here's a little clip of Dr Mary McAuliffe on the night at the main guard. I hope you enjoy and I'll speak to you again in two weeks. What I want to talk about is my ongoing interest and research in, as we go move through this decade of centenaries, of the revolutionary women. And since the conference in 2014 that I organised, I was then the president of the Women's History Association of Ireland, and the government and the commemorative committee seemed to be doing nothing much about this was the centenary of the founding of Cumann Amman. So we approached them and said, give us some money, which they did, and we'll do it. And we did, and we did a three-day event. The president, Michael D. Higgins, thank goodness he's still president for the rest of the decade of centenaries, came to Glasnevin, where we did a wreath laying at uh, Elizabeth O'Farrell's grave. Elizabeth O'Farrell, who brought out the surrender flag uh, in 1916, but was so much more than that as well, an activist, uh, 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 unrepentant Republican for all of her life, uh, and a woman who chose to live her life with another woman as well. So many of these women made radical personal and political choices. And then we had, the next day, we had a reenactment from Anu Productions, who do site-specific uh, theatrical productions of the first meeting of Common Amman, which was very affecting at one stage. Uh, one of the women who was dressed as a Common Amman woman pressed what seemed to be a little piece of skull into my hand and said, would you kill for Ireland? And I thought, ooh, I don't know (laughs) whether I would or not. Um, And it it made the history seem more real, even to a historian who who studies it all the time. And then we had a two-day international conference, which demonstrated that there was enough material on Cumann Amman alone, without looking at the broader revolutionary period, to host two full days of parallel sessions talking about women in revolutionary history. Uh, and many of my colleagues have credited that commemorative three days of kick-starting this interest in revolutionary women that has only grown more and more since. 2016, I think the women really were the starring uh, people uh, in, in terms of the commemoration. Uh, and it has continued. The interest has not died. And I think in many ways it's because these are new stories They were there all along, but we never heard them. And that's what I want to do today, is to talk about some of the new stories that are now being told of this period, of the period of 1919 to the end of the War of Independence, and and maybe touching on the Civil War as well, because I think that is going to be a difficult one that we need to commemorate, particularly in in places like where I'm from, in Kerry, where it was very, very vicious. Uh, But we will deal with it, and we have, as I said, a guiding hand in a president who understands, because of the divisions in his own family, what happened during the Civil War. But what I want to talk to you today is about histories, memories, legacies. So it's kind of a broad scoping conversation about coming on, about the revolutionary women. And I shall start just uh, giving a little bit of context. In September 1918, as coming on held its annual convention in Dublin, a note of thanks was expressed to the many women around the country who worked tirelessly to organise and establish new branches. And this was in the post-rising period. Among the many women expressly thanked was a Miss O'Reardon in Cahar-Savine and a Miss Hurley in Tralee in County Kerry for their valuable work in organising in their own neighbourhood. But this wasn't an unusual note of thanks, and it is indicative of the work that local branches were putting into organising and expanding. It was now moving out of Dublin. Dublin was the focus of 1916, but I think we have to see the rest of the revolutionary period is outside of Dublin. I mean, Dublin will be important, but most of the action is happening outside of Dublin. By 1919, Common Amman was spreading to almost every town and village in the country. Yet to date, no detailed study has been undertaken of their contributions to the Revolutionary War. In the last decades, the contribution of Common Amman to the Revolutionary Decades has been researched and outlined, mainly at the executive level, what they did at the grand political level. 
The official narrative at national level has moved from simply seeing Cumann Amman as passive auxiliaries of the Irish volunteers and later the IRA to seeing the organisation as central to the histories of the period. Almost 300 Cumann Amman women took part in the Easter Rising, but thousands more would be active in the 1919-1922 period. At regional level, however, the histories of the organisation are less well known, and I'm delighted to see that they're in this book about the area around here. And that's what we need. We need regional histories. We need to go down to the regional level, the town level, and the, uh, the village level and bring all those histories together. Lack of sufficient documentation precluded detailed regional histories, but with the digitization of sources like the military archives, pensions applications, and renewed interest in and collection of and access to sources by and about women of the period, we can now undertake those much needed regional studies. So coming on, just for those of you who don't know, was founded in 1914 in Wynn's Hotel in Dublin, an organization for women who espoused a nationalist ideology and who would be supportive of the Irish Volunteers, which had been founded some months earlier in November 1913. They adopted a green uniform, as you can see there, with a slouch hat and a badge, a a rifle with the initials intertwined, which meant that their militarism was evident from their uniform and their statements and training from the off. The organisation participated fully in 1916. Here's a photograph taken later in 1916, and all of these women... There's 66 of them in there. There were 77 women in Richmond Barracks, but we use this as the main photo. Include, you know, the, the woman here with the berets, Elizabeth O'Farrell. So all of the women whose names you would recognise are in there. Uh, they, they were out in 1916. When confusion was rife about orders and counter-orders in the initial stages of the rising, it was the women of Cumann Amman who traversed the country carrying messages from Pierce, Connolly and the other leaders in the GPO. During the week of the rising, there were coming among women in all the outposts except Poland's Mill, and we all know why. <laughs> and as the week ended and defeat became inevitable, Pierce selected Elizabeth O'Farrell, she with the berry there, to present the surrender with him to the British authorities. O'Farrell, a working class woman, and this has been interesting as well, we are moving outside of the more middle class educated women's histories as well, to see these working class women who got involved. And Uh, asking questions about what motivated their involvement in nationalism. They come in through trade union activism, for the most part. She was born and raised in the tenements in City Quay, uh, had been a long-time member of Common Amman, of the Irish Women's Franchise League, of the Gaelic League, of Indian and the Heron, uh, and of the Irish Women's Workers' Union, and had been involved in the 1913 lockout. So you can see there are patterns developing here. In the post-rising period, Common Amman worked to keep the revolutionary spirit alive, particularly as much of the male leadership was either dead or in prison. For instance, in 1917, they sent an appeal to the president of the USA, Woodrow Wilson, looking for his recognition for the justice of Ireland's demands for political freedom, and it was presented to him by Hannah Sheehy Skeffington. In 1918, Cumann and Mann were fighting both for the freedom of Ireland and for women's freedom, equal citizenship within the new state that they imagined coming into being regardless of gender. By then, its president, Countess Markievicz, stated Cumann Amman demanded full suffrage. And at the 1918 Cumann Amman Convention, the women reaffirmed their role in fighting for an Irish republic, but they also insisted that they would follow the policy of the Republican Proclamation, 1916, by seeing that women take up their proper position in the life of the nation. And that, again, is echoing the equality promised in the 1916 Proclamation. For coming among nationally and regionally, the biggest campaigns in 1918 were the anti-conscription and election campaigns. And the anti-conscription campaign happened because at that time, obviously, the Russians had taken themselves out of the war, so now the Germans were only fighting a war on one front, so a big push was expected on the Western Front. The British had used up almost all conscription in England, Scotland and Wales, there was really no more pool of men to draw from. The one place where there was a huge pool of men to draw from, of course, was Ireland. But of course, Ireland now was a very different place post-1916. 